This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is brought to you by Givoke, the world's only liquid stable glucagon. Givoke is available in a pre filled syringe and an incredibly convenient to carry and easy to use hypo pen. As a matter of fact, I have a trainer of the hypo pen right here. Let me show you how easy it is to use. Cap comes off, I find some skin, press down, and it's done. That easy to administer glucagon. It's the easiest thing I've ever seen when it comes to glucagon, hands down. We're gonna talk all about it today. How the Givoke glucagon came to be, what it is, and this brand new hypo pen, which is incredibly convenient to carry. And as you just heard, super simple to administer. Anybody could do this in my opinion. Before I start the show, let me say thank you because every question in this episode came directly from listeners of the podcast. So I really appreciate the effort and the thought that you guys put into those questions. And I hope you get your answers. I think you're going to. Today's episode is going to be a little different than most. I'm interviewing two people today about Givo Glucagon. First, well, not even first. Now, here's the surprise. Let me just give you the surprise. Jenny's on this episode. Jenny Smith is here. And I'm also speaking with Ken Johnson. Now, Ken is the Senior Vice President of Clinic... Wow, this is quite a title here, Ken. Senior Vice President, Clinical Development, Regulatory, Quality Assurance, and Medical Affairs at Xeris Pharmaceuticals. Xeris makes Juvoke. Ken's going to answer all of your questions, and Jenny's going to answer some, too. You guys, you love Jenny. I love Jenny. How do we not love Jenny? Guess who else you're going to love? Ken. Ken, who, by the way, has a secret talent. The man can play the piano, but you'll have to wait all the way to the end to find out about that. Please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. Givoke is a prescription injection for the treatment of very low blood sugar in adults and kids with diabetes ages 2 and above. Do not use if you have a specific type of adrenal or pancreatic tumor, starvation, chronic low blood sugar, or allergy to Givoke. Severe allergic reactions can occur. Visit givokeglucagon.com slash risk for more information. Getting a Givoke prescription has never been easier. And there are two ways that you can request it through your doctor, either online or in person. If you have commercial insurance, you can request a prescription for Givoke Hypopen right from the comfort of your home and have it delivered to your door fulfilled through pill pack by Amazon Pharmacy. Just go to givokeglucagon.com to learn more. And there'll be links right here in the show notes, by the way. Now, if you'd rather go the traditional route, you can see your doctor in person and request a prescription. For a limited time, Xeris is offering a $0 copay for commercially eligible patients to help ensure that as many people as possible can access the Givoke Hypopen. Okay, it's time to get to the show. We're going to start with Jenny Smith and then do a little Ken and then back to a little Jen and Ken. You're going to get a nice rhythm going. Little Jen, little Ken. It's going to go just like that. I think you're going to enjoy it. At the risk of repeating myself because I say it in the episode... This is a leap for people who use insulin, making glucagon liquid stable. It just is. If you don't understand why, listen closely. Jenny, I already talked to Ken Johnson from Xeris Pharmaceuticals about the Givoke Glucagon, and he's going to be on the show in just a minute. We talked a little bit just about what they were, you know, what they're trying to accomplish. I told him at the end of our conversation that I'm incredibly excited about that company. Like the, the ability to stabilize glucagon in a liquid form, I think has other far reaching possibilities that I'm really excited about. But while I was talking to him, I got a, uh, it's a, it's a, you know, if you can see this or not, but it, it's, it's called their hypo pen and yeah. it's, this is just a trainer. So it's not, it's not real, but you just pop off the cap and go like this. Yep. And it, that's it. And it's over. Yep. And I was like, huh, well that seems simple. And, uh, I'm going to get one of those for Arden. Beyond simple. It's not scary. Exactly. Because, you know, till this point in my life with type one diabetes, Glucagon has been 
a little bit of an uh, it looked like a science experiment. It was going to be an, in a pressure situation. <laughs> it it, it's almost like someone saying to you, you know, here, do this while you're driving a car and there's a bear in the back seat. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, exactly. kind of felt like that to me the whole time. Um, right. And and they have their pre they have their pre mixed syringes for emergencies mm-hmm. too, which is just right. you know it, it's you just it's in and push and you're done right. Yep. But but still, I'm I'm going to ask you first before I tell you what we do. Do you carry glucagon with you when you leave the house? I don't carry glucagon with me if I'm just leaving the house for like going to the grocery store or going across the street to the park. No, I don't. I I absolutely don't. When we leave to go on even like a short weekend to our in-laws or I go on, you know, to speak somewhere or whatnot. Yes, I carry it with me. Now, in that same case, though, you know, if I'm carrying it with me in my pocket at a conference, is somebody going to know it's in my pocket? They're not. (laughs) There's a lady on the floor. Hey, there's a science kit in her pants. What do you think that, what what should we do? We're in the same boat. We don't carry it around like that either. If we're going to go too far away or if it's going to be, if you're going to the beach or a trip, it comes with us. So here's my question. Would you carry this with you? I would because one, that's really easy to keep in my purse. And I mean, I've also, you know, knowing that I've got a son who'll be in second grade, something like this, easier to carry, I think. Um, And from the standpoint of even teaching him, visibly, there's no needle. I could easily say, hey, pull this cap off, you know, stick it in my thigh, (laughs) push it until it turns red and it clicks and it's done. I mean, that's it. It has these audio responses. I don't know if you can hear the sec. So there's two. There's the push Yep. And then the second yes. one tells you you're done. Yep. And I was like, huh, this I would put in Arden's bag. Like I really Absolutely. would. It's not going to scare somebody. And not only that, but if somebody opened this up, a person who had no idea what they were doing, it's going it, to, you know, the packaging tells you what to do. And there's nothing about the, the, what I said to Ken when I was talking to him was I took this out of the mail, this trainer, and I handed it to my wife and I said, I don't want to tell you anything about it. See if you can make it work. And she did it right away. Like, it didn't take any, like, thought to do. It's easy. Hey, Scott, this is Ken Johnson. Um, I'm with Xeris Pharmaceuticals, and I have a number of responsibilities at the company, including how we develop our drugs uh, in the clinic and get them approved by the FDA. We also have a medical team that supports uh, people with diabetes and their clinicians in the marketplace. And I also have a quality assurance team that makes sure that the drugs, as we make them, package them and ship them to pharmacies and ultimately people in their homes uh, meet the high quality standards required uh, for a prescription product. So all those combined um, have been my responsibility at Xeris Pharmaceuticals for the past three years. Um, I've been in this type of role for pharmaceutical development for better part of 25 years. I started out, I uh, was trained as a pharmacist. Um, I did research at the University of Colorado Uh, where I was also involved in clinical research. And as a result of that clinical research, I found my way into the pharmaceutical industry sector and have been there ever since. So that's a little bit about me. I'm I'm in Chicago, where our headquarters are based, and really happy to be with you today. Well, thank you very much for doing this. Um, I have a question about how you pull a team together for something like this. Does Paul know of you and come for you, or how does that work? Like, How do you end up at Xeris? Great question. So Paul Edick, our CEO, is someone who I met um, at the early part of my career. So 20 plus years ago, uh, we were at a company based in Chicago called Searle Pharmaceuticals. Paul was in charge of a number of commercial activities there uh, and ultimately taking over um, some of the regional activities around the world uh, for a number of our products. And I was his medical support. So you know, these things start early and have sort of an indelible effect. If these partnerships work and these collaborations work, you sort of maintain these relationships throughout your professional arc. We haven't always worked together, but off and on, we've been together at a couple other companies since that time. And most recently, as he took the helm at Cirrus, he wanted to bring together a group of folks that he felt could take us to the next level, um, get Jivo Kaipo Pen to market. And um, with that, he found me as well as a few others, uh, we had this collective past together 
So it's a little bit analogous to getting the band back together again. And we've, we've done that. And because of our past uh, familiarity, success together, uh, what I think is the ease of collaboration, we do enjoy working together. And I'm sure I'll do it again someday. Yeah. Do you feel like the from the starting point to where you guys are right now, do you feel like that was on schedule, went quicker than you anticipated? How much of that has to do with the 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 you know the Givoke itself and and how well it does what it's you know what you're trying to what you're trying to do? Yeah, I think we encountered a situation where things were a little bit stalled or or there was a few things that we had to um, take heed of that had been discovered before we arrived to make sure that we had. Um, you know, a product that could meet all the standards of the FDA, could pass all the clinical assessments. And so a really good foundation, Scott, but it needed then sort of to be rebooted, uh, to use that term. And, and that meant um, conducting um, additional clinical studies, um, further characterizing the product, making sure that we could put it into a pre-filled syringe. That's our PFS configuration or the hypopen, the auto injector that was just released earlier this month. Right. So that whole process of building, making, testing, and then releasing um, brought together the team that you see today. You know, in fairness, there were about 12, 15 people at Xeris when Paul took over. And, you know, it's taken a lot of, you know, resources, people, energy now, and 200 plus employees uh, later, um, you know, we're on market with an approved product. Yeah, for me to be sitting here holding this um this trainer pen, I guess it's a, it's a long time to get this into, get it into this form and make sure it does what it says. So I think I want to understand what does it do? Because you, you've obviously come into a space where everyone has that red box and they, you know, generally think of it as something, you know, that they just have, they don't think much about it. I've been in that situation my whole life. I get my daughter's supplies, my daughter's supplies show up they're there. I watch it until the expiration date and then I throw it away and I get another one. Um, and I don't know that it's something that many people think about other than I know in the case of an emergency, you know, I've got this liquid and this powder and this syringe and I'm supposed to mix them together and redraw them and use them. And here's how, and you know, and that kind of thing. And I have to train my school nurse to do it. And you know, my, my her grandmom's got to know. So when she comes over, that's, that's, that's the narrative around that my whole life and for, for many, many people. So how do you improve on what's been going on for so long? Like what makes you feel like this is a great business and we should be doing this? Well, I think, you know, just listening to your story and the kind of the anxiety and complications that come with uh, administering glucagon uh, for you know many, many years now, you know, going on several decades of having the same, um, configuration. You know, it is a important pancreatic hormone. Uh, glucagon has very well-known effects in terms of its ability to raise blood sugar. Um, I think, you know, most days we're concerned about lowering blood sugar and, and insulin's critical, but, you know, think of this as the uh, sort of the, the break with the accelerator. The, um, you know, the, the challenge has always been, it's a powder that requires reconstitution or, or put into solution immediately at time of use. You can't do it early because it starts to break down very quickly. Most of the potency is lost within 24 hours after mixing the powder. Mm -hmm. So for all these decades, that red box that you described has been the single and only configuration available to people with diabetes or folks who would experience very low blood sugar. So our chief scientific officer took that on as a mission, um, you know, had his own uh, personal experience and people in his life who said, you know, is it possible? to overcome all those complicating uh, multi-step requirements of the uh, lyophilized powder in that vial. And he said, yeah, I think I can fix that. So it was his mission to make it a liquid, ready to use, room temperature stable product. And to do that, we had to overcome the limitations of water. And, and water is what you would use in the traditional kit to uh, make it a solution. Uh, so we've taken water and replaced it with other uh, well-known um, solutions. Um, ours is called DMSO. Um, and you know, that's a recognized safe um, product that is in many FDA approved products mm -hmm. and in the right proportion in the right steps of manufacturing. And all of our know-how has led to being able to concentrate this glucagon in a liquid form that you now have available in the hypopen 
and the pre-filled syringe. Um, yeah, we didn't change how the glucagon worked. And I think maybe this conversation hasn't occurred as much as it could now because there's new configurations available and it's much easier to, to use and administer. But, you know, it's, it's a great solution when you have um, a very low blood sugar. You know, it raises blood glucose, um, works with the glycogen that's stored in your liver, converts that into glucose very rapidly. And so you have basically a, a built-in system to raise your, your blood glucose. Um, and as such, we, you know, we wanted to just make the process of administering it very approachable, very intuitive, not intimidating. And so uh, we think we've accomplished that. But that was all only facilitated once we had a liquid version. Right. After someone uses Juvo, what happens afterwards? Are there side effects? Are there things that happen afterwards? Am I going to feel nauseous? Do I have to go to the hospital? That, that's a good question. Also, what's your dog's name? <laughs> yeah, Bailey liked that question. So uh, I, guess, I guess we'll have to give her a credit today. So a couple of things. I mean, you know, the effect that you do want is to raise blood glucose, and that happens very quickly. We start to see changes in uh, the blood glucose concentration within the first five minutes of administering the product. Um, it was raised, you know, to what we consider a safe level of blood glucose um, very quickly, um, you know, on average about 14 to 15 minutes. And then the duration of action is probably about 90 minutes or so. So you, you have this ability to sort of bring yourself back up and then have it come back down. Right. So it's a, it's a temporary fix to what was a scary low. Mm -hmm. um, what can happen? Uh, glucagon has some other effects. Um, it has some effects directly on the gastrointestinal tract. And so about 30% of the subjects in our uh, trials had some nausea and about 10% had some vomiting. So those are uh, 10, 15%. Those are kind of the hallmark features of what glucagon does, no matter what, to, to, to anyone um, that's sensitive to those GI side effects. Importantly, um, they are transient. They are mild. 80% um, of the people in our study characterize them as mild. They went away. And in our case, no one actually stopped being in our study um, because they had that, um, that known side effect. I see. You, that you would see that, Scott, with the old glucagon. You would see it with our glucagon. Uh, you'll see it with future glucagon. So uh, that we haven't mitigated. It's probably dose related. I think, you know, there will be a day, I hope someday where um, if we, you know, use different doses uh, for different purposes that we can mitigate some of that nausea and vomiting, but um, for the rescue um, one milligram setting of use, you're going to have in some cases uh, nausea and vomiting. Then those side effects are side effects of glucagon, not of a specific brand. It's just what happens during the process of bringing that low blood sugar up so quickly through glucagon. <sighs> Yeah, and it may not even be. Re you're right. That's that's the correct way to describe it. Um, and it may not even be related to the blood glucose going back up as much as it is. There is a known effect of glucagon to slow down um, the action of your GI tract. I see. So much so that uh, completely different from what we're talking about today. But uh, radiologists will actually use this drug to stop someone's GI tract from moving if they need to do procedures and and uh, other things. So. Now, this is one of those situations where a bad thing for some person is a good thing for another, but it is important to let people know that there is some mild um, nausea in about 30% of uh, people who use it for, um, for rescue. Can you help me understand the different ways that I can administer Juvoke? Um, when, you know, when you guys first came out and I became aware of you, my daughter switched to it and she has the, the pre-filled syringe. Uh, but now I'm holding, like I said, this this dummy um, pen that to me feels like uh, like what people would consider an EpiPen to be. I, I, I just push it down on my leg and hold it there for a second and, or a couple of seconds and, and I pull it away. Why do you have different versions? And can you tell me the difference between them? Sure. Um, the glucagon is the same for both uh, GVO PFS or pre syringe and GVO hypopen, the auto injector that you're holding uh, in your hand. Um, so there's no difference in that. The, the active ingredient, the solution, the concentration is identical. Um, it was a simpler and more straightforward manufacturing process to come to market with the pre-filled syringe. Mm. Uh, it's less mechanical requirements um, because you as a person or the person helping you is actually going to do the injection, much like you would uh, self-inject or inject insulin, right? So it's a small subcutaneous injection. Um, 
the necessary requirements to then put that into a device that fires itself, the auto injector. Um, it's more complicated, more engineering, and we wanted to make sure we had sufficient quantity so we come to market like we did this month and not have any uh, sense of shortages or, or, or running out, and be able to supply the market adequately. So um, there's a really, really high specification for performance of that auto injector because you're no longer responsible for pressing the plunger. Um, the mechanics inside that auto injector are. And so the FDA has carefully scrutinized the performance of this device and it has to work 99.999% of the time. So that's a manufacturing spec. Um, and it came out of the experience that we've all had with epinephrine and EpiPen. Um, we wanna make darn sure that if someone's going to pull that red cap off and press that yellow plunger, um, that it fires. And so that took us a little more time. Both were approved last September in 2019. Um, we could bring the pre-filled syringe to market immediately. Um, and then to deal with all the issues that I just laid out, uh, we just need a little more time and happy to release that now in July. Oh, that's exciting. It really, it really is terrific. As I'm sitting here holding it, I mean, the, the leap, and leap really is the only word from what I'm accustomed to to this. It's, you know, it's like they're not even the same species, you know, to be, to be honest. It's a, it's a great, it's a great advancement. So, I mean, whoever that guy is who figured out how to make that, that liquid stable stuff is, uh, He's brilliant. Hey, have you ever used glucagon? I've never used glucagon. No. I'm knocking. I'm knocking on my wooden Jenny's desk nodding. right Jenny's now. She's knocking on everything. She's like, no. <laughs> so uh, the reason I asked is because while while we were talking about this, he said, you know, we we were talking about people administering it themselves, and I'm trying to think. I was really trying to picture like where's the tipping point where you're it's got to be, you know, it's not going to be one of those like, oh, I got a little low, I need to eat something. Obviously, that's that's first. But there's probably a moment where you, I, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, imagine you're on a CGM and you see you have double arrows down and you're 50 and you think, you know, you do the math real quick and you think, oh, my God, I gave myself too much insulin. I can't catch this. Stop this. Do this like this. Right. Yeah. Um, That made a lot of sense to me. I I've definitely been in situations where I thought, I don't know if I'm going to stop this with food and, right. you know, and right. that's for Arden, but I really thinking about adults living by themselves. Okay. Ken, I have a question that, um, I heard you say a second ago, uh, you were talking about self injection. And I think that there are many people who might assume that glucagon is only for when you're having a seizure or unconscious, but how would I self inject if I'm having a seizure or unconscious. So obviously that's not the only time to use it. When are the times I'm supposed to be using this or, or I'm able to? Yeah, I think that that's a great discussion. Thanks for raising that point. So I think, you know, there are a number of settings. Everybody has their own personal experience with what they deem very low blood sugar. Um, I think you and some of your colleagues have taught me this phrase, the I don't know low, right? And so when that happens, it could be because you are looking at your numbers. It could be because you start to feel differently. Um, and, you know, some of the sort of classic signs and symptoms are you're shaky, you're dizzy, confused, maybe you have a change in your personality, you're a little more combative, um, you know, trouble answering questions, those sorts of things are all kind of hallmark signs of I'm going low. Um, so when that starts to happen, of course, the first rule of thumb is try to correct it with food or drink, right? And mm. some your favorite uh, source of glucose. Um, you know, that's for many, many decades now been referred to as the 15-15 rule. You know, take those 15 grams and wait 15 minutes and see if it's working, if you're improving. So that's one situation. Maybe that isn't working and it's a stubborn low and, um, you know, you're starting to now wonder what's next. So that would be a, a time to consider administering uh, glucagon. And I think most people would not have reached some state of uh, incapacitation where, if they were familiar and able to uh, administer the auto injector or the pre-filled syringe, they could. There are other settings where people are un unwilling or unable to swallow or to have enough um, you know, uh, stuff available. Maybe they're a place where they don't even have access uh, to a source of glucose. Um, that would be another situation. 
if you feel like you're passing out and there's somebody with you, obviously you'd want them to be able to administer it. And so you know, this is a community discussion. You should uh, know the other people in your life, be familiar with where your glucagon is and how to administer it. Um, as you pointed out, this uh, hypopen auto injector is super intuitive and the instructions are printed right on the pouch. And so I think if somebody found you and you said, you know, let's use it, um, you know, it's going to be a very straightforward process. We have tested that um, and found that in simulation exercises where someone is going through simulation of an emergency and a very low blood sugar, they were able to administer it correctly 99% of the time. Yeah. Follow the instructions and do the two-step process that, that you just talked about. When the, when the trainer arrived at my house, I took it out of the packaging. I took the instructions away from it. I handed it to my wife and said, I told her what it was. And I said, don't even think about it. Try to use it. And it didn't take her 10 seconds to figure out what to do with it. And nobody here has ever used, you know, an EpiPen or anything like that. So we've never held or seen anything like this before. And I, that made me feel like, I hope my insurance company will cover a bunch of them to spread them all over Arden's, uh, college experience when she leaves for school, right? I'll just, I'll just put one everywhere. Um, it, it just really was intuitive is the word, like it, it's, you can't look at it and hold it. And it, like, you, there's no other thing to do with it. I don't know if that makes sense or not. You know what I mean? Like it feels like there's just one way to accomplish something. And it, and it shows you that while you're holding it, like you said, it's in the instructions, but I'm saying when you have the physical thing in your hand, you, it's not like there's seven levers and you got to decide which one it is. It only does one thing. And then, you know, if it does it well, then perfect. It does. Yeah. And I think, was, you know, that was part of the design, uh, the understanding, you know, there's a whole area of science, human factors research that sort of says, how do we approach something and to solve a problem? And, you know, there's very, very intentional features built into that auto injector. The colors are intentional. The little window that you have that shows the liquid glucagon, you know, in there, mm -hmm. uh, and it disappears and turns red when when the dose has been delivered. That's intentional. The clicks that you hear, those are intentional um, to let you know sort of an audio cue uh, that the cycle has been completed. Um, we also have safety built in. When you um, finish the injection and withdraw the plunger from the bare skin, it locks out, and so you cannot have a needle stick uh, because there is a needle inside that device, but it's um, you know, never appears during the process of the injection. And when you're finished, it's locked out. So you can't have an accidental needle stick. Can I ask where can, it, can you just inject it? I mean, anywhere, like, where is it? Where did you, where were you able to get the FDA approval? And how do I remember that when I'm going low, like, you know, or is it just anywhere I can get it into me is good. Yeah. We, we concentrated on three areas, the thigh, the abdomen and your upper arm. So we figure in most cases, one of those is going to be readily accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you do have to have bare skin because we want to make sure, you know, this is a 27 gauge needle. We want to make sure that um, there's nothing sort of inhibiting its path as it goes into the skin. Um, but, uh, you know, we, in our assessment, Scott, most people opted for the abdomen. I think it's probably easy to just you know, pull your shirt up and um, most people have, you know, adequate real estate there. So, you know, uh, I was going to say, I'm okay. I don't, I might, I won't need glucagon, but, um, uh, but I definitely have a place to inject it. <laughs> so, so, so any, any of those three sites yeah. and it didn't matter, you know, the results and the, the clinical changes that we saw were the same, um, regardless of site. Well, that's even, that's very exciting. Cause for, like I said, for people who know about older products, you know, it, uh, we were always taught, you know, deepest part of the buttocks, you know, like it's, it's a big needle, it, you know, it's, uh, it's not an exciting not an exciting endeavor for certain. Um, so even that's a, a huge leap. Uh, is my insurance going to pay for this? How do I, how, I mean, that that's part of your purview, right? When you were talking earlier about what it is you, uh, you've done in the past. And it, so you, I'm assuming you have some background on this. You can talk about it a little bit. Yeah, I do. You know, you never want to have a drug approved, but then not have any access for people. Um, and so, you know, that's an important uh, contribution that the company had to make in terms of going to insurance companies, going to pharmaceutical benefits management companies, you know, very close to the time of our approval last September um, and have these discussions about why it would be so critical to be able to offer this new, um, much easier, much more approachable version of glucagon than the one they have been covering. So there wasn't any restriction on your red kits. And so we just asked, you know, can you give us the same treatment? And I'm happy to report that as we sit here today um, for commercially insured individuals, 
Uh, you have unrestricted coverage at 87% of plans in the United States. So almost 90%. Wow. That, you know, I, why isn't it a hundred? There's no product that ever has a hundred. So there's always some small portion where there's going to be additional requirements. So that would mean that you would, you know, probably still have a copay um, and everybody's plans are different. Mm. You know, this can vary, um, but you won't get one of these not covered types of messages in the 87% of covered lives in the United States. Um, for commercial insurance. If you look at Medicare, probably the next uh, biggest segment for people with diabetes um, who should have glucagon, it's about 80%. Um, and then we're still working our way through the Medicaid requirements and we're about 43% on Medicaid. Um, so, if, you know, for most folks, um, you're not going to have um, any significant access issues. In terms of affordability, um, we are right now, if you go to gmoglucagon.com. You can get all the details on a copay assistance program. And the net effect of that, Scott, is you would have a $0 out of pocket uh, for the hypopen um, for, for the present time. So we're, we're starting out the launch of the product, offering that additional support, which means if you say had a $30 copay and you qualified for the program, um, the company would subsidize that $30. You would essentially receive it for free. Oh, that's excellent. Um, uh- Great. What was the web address? Gvokeglucagon.com. It's G-V-O-K-E. I've had a few people say, gosh, you know, how do you pronounce that? But uh, G-V-O-K-E, glucagon.com. Gvokeglucagon.com. I got it. Uh, and I'll put it in the show notes so people can find it too. So if someone's using a different glucagon right now and they've heard you and think, I would like to try this, do they wait to their next appointment, go to their doctor um, and say, I want to switch my glucagon or, or what are the pathways to making the change? Yeah, I, I think any of those might work. I think traditionally when we need something new, we would contact our healthcare provider and say, there's a new glucagon. It's called Gvoke Hypopen. Um, can you send me a prescription for that? Can I get it filled? Um, our experience with clinicians is they're pretty well aware now that this is a configuration that's on the market. Uh, we've been working hard with professional societies and through their channels to make sure that they know that as a, a person with diabetes requests it, that they would um, you know, know of it and, and not be afraid to write the prescription. Because of the access issues now have also been cleared, that makes it very easy for them. So it's not very cumbersome. If you um, don't want to pursue it that way and just make a call to the doctor's office, it usually doesn't require a visit, Scott. It's just a you know, new script is uh, issued from the electronic system and you can pick it up at your favorite pharmacy. Um, you can also go to the website and we've set up some services there, a little bit more analogous to kind of ordering online. And you could enter some personal information, information about your doctor. Um, and we have um, support services uh, available now uh, through PillPack, an Amazon company uh, that will work with your doctor and deliver it to your home at no cost. I'm not sure I heard you right. Is it PillPack? Yeah. So the okay. the that uh, helps assist in sort of the transactional part of this is PillPack. It's an Amazon company. Uh, but the easiest thing to do is to go to gvoglucagon.com and start that process. And, and you'll see, you know, the sort of order entry information is there. Okay. That's for those instances where you would just say, you know, it might be easier to, to start and do this on your own. Uh, but, but either way, um, this is not an area where, um, the standard of practice has been to make sure that people on insulin or other drugs that cause severe low blood sugar um, should have glucagon. And so it's, it's not a difficult conversation and, and clinicians, I think, are actually relieved to know that you care and, and want to have, have this tool. Right. So if someone listening just feels that economically they can't do this, they, they should be able to and contacting you is the way to go. It is. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think, listen, there's, there could always be some lag in whether or not the coverage policy is caught up and, and maybe they're getting a strange answer about how much uh, their out of pocket would be and things like that. We, we have a whole assistance program in place to help navigate that. We know how frustrating that is. You know, we wanted to make glucagon easy to use, and now we want to make getting your prescription filled easy to do. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we have very a um, nice set of services that are linked to the website. Um, there's also a phone number um, at the website in case it's easier just to, to call and talk to a real human. But, you know, that takes you through a whole tiered process of, you know, is it going to be covered? You know, what pharmacies have it and, and so on. And then right down to even some patient assistance programs 
uh, for folks who can't afford their medication. The concept of having to mix glucagon stopped us from using glucagon when Arden was legitimately having a seizure. Um, right. I just don't know that, I, I mean, you know, technology is better now, obviously, and that's great, but I don't see, I can't imagine going backwards on this one. Like this to me seems like the best that's available. Right. I was wondering, do you hear from people about mixing and what did they, what are the responses? Do you think that that having to mix the glucagon stops people from even considering it as an option sometimes? I think given that that was all that there was all that was available for such a long time. I mean, you know, again, thankfully my parents never had to to deal with that. They never had to mix it. They never had to, it was always there. Mm -hmm. They always knew where it was in the house. Um, but I, I would say that it's certainly a deterrent to use because it's, there are just the extra steps again, as you brought up in your situation, it's like having to think through those steps when you've got your loved one, either having a seizure or you've discovered them completely like not with it at all out, can't talk to them, whatever your brain is thinking in terms of helping them, yes, but all the steps of mixing, making sure it was mixed right, and now you've got, I mean, the needle on that, I mean, it's a scary looking needle compared to a syringe needle for insulin. It's it's a bigger needle, right? right? So yeah. you know, imagine putting that into your two-year-old or even your 12-year-old child and knowing that you're doing it the right way. And I can say that it would be, a it's a deterrent, although... I don't know, in the case of not having anything else as an option, you figure it out, yeah, yeah, right. but it's, it's certainly going to be slower. Well, I have a friend who recently had a teenage son uh, have a seizure and she got the red box out. She got it mixed. And when she went to draw it back out, like in the, what you're describing, running upstairs, people yelling, she broke the needle off. Oh, no. Isn't that crazy? So they had to go to a secondary option, but they were getting ready to use it. And she, she was trying to traverse stairs and mix glucagon at the same time. She was oh, running no. to where it was happening, you know? Oh. And I think, I just think that that's the point is that anything that simplifies that is genius and right. putting it in, you know, what can be described to people who don't know any different uh, is as an EpiPen style, like right. just this thing in your hand that you just push down and hold This this turns it into something people can carry with them, I think. Absolutely. I even think, too, from a school-type setting, um, even the comfort level of, let's say for some reason, you know, technology is down, you're not able to contact the parent, you don't know exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the standpoint of safety and feeling okay, teachers or the paras or whoever is helping at school, this is 100% easier. I think this takes away from that thing that a lot of people who who know who have kids know you go to school and you're like I need somebody to be a glucagon advocate for my kid and everybody's like no thank you you know right. like like they really do too like teachers are like I don't want to be on the hook for this but it but this is like again I think this takes away the possibility that they can make a misstep in the middle like draw I, when Arden was little her her directions were draw up half the vial you should have saw the fear yes. that put on someone's face. Well, how do I measure half the vial? I'm like, I don't know. Eyeball it. And they're like, what? And I'm like, okay, <laughs> here we go. This is fine. Right. After I get either the pre-filled syringe or the hypo pen, how long do they last until they need to be replaced? Yeah, that was part of our design criteria. We didn't just want to make it liquid ready to use. We wanted to make sure it could last a long time because, you know, hopefully the once or twice a year event at most. Um, And even if it's a never event, you know, let's not have to replace it too often. So right now from the time of manufacture to the end of life or or potency uh, sufficient for um, restoring blood glucose is two years. So it's it's a very long shelf life. Um, You know, we, again, you know, that was part of the design process and certification process and uh, approval with the FDA that we have a two year uh, from time to manufacture 
uh, expiration. So that'll be printed on the, on the product. You'll know when it expires. And, and a number of pharmacies now even have reminder programs. Um, so, you know, it's time to get another one. Ken, I have to tell you, uh, and I genuinely mean this, I've spoken to a lot of people who work for pe- you know manufacturers of different drugs and, and devices and that's the first time anyone's ever said anything to me that almost knocked me off of my chair. I just <laughs> two years is it's amazing and and not what I expected you to say. Um that's because what I was going to say is, you know, we got the pre-filled syringe and I had a question about that actually before I go down my story. We got the pre-filled syringe and it comes in sort of a pillow bag is my best description of it. And my first thought was, huh, there's a needle in there, and this is sort of a bag. And then when I reached out to the people who listen to the podcast, that was actually a question they had was, you know, why does the, like, explain to me why the, the needle is safe in this bag. And I guess, I guess thinking, couldn't it be deployed? But so answer that for me first. Like, obviously, you didn't make something and not think, oh, I wonder, you know, I'm, I'm assuming it's been tested. But explain to me how you came to the, the, the packaging for the pre-filled syringe. Yeah, it serves a number of purposes. The packaging is a sealed foil pouch. Um, it's, it's done in a very uh, controlled environment. Um, the pre-filled syringe that you described, Scott, actually has a needle shield on it. It also has a backstop to keep the plunger from uh, being deployed. Mm-hmm. Uh, so why a pouch? I think you started with that question. So first of all, the instructions are printed on the pouch. And we want to make sure because, you know, the real estate on the, on the pre-filled syringe or the real estate on the auto injector is not sufficient to describe how to use it. It, it would be six point font and you wouldn't be able to read it. Mm-hmm. We have these very clear pictures and words printed right on the pouch um, that could tell uh, anyone how to use it. And in fact, we tested that. We had people who were untrained in the administration of the pre-filled syringe and the auto injector. And they successfully administered it, um, you know, like I said before, 99% of the time. So the second is that foil and the gas that we pack it in um, inside there, because you notice it's like a pillow because it's actually got some uh, pressurized gas in there, helps with um, and moisture uh, because those are the enemies of any drug. doesn't matter if it's glucagon or anything else, um, sort of protecting it from light and moisture helps contribute to that two-year shelf life. So we, we can't stress enough that you should keep it in these pouches until the time of use. Um, one people, you know, people may say, well, geez, how will I know what to do, what's inside that pouch? So that's why we've provided videos. That's why we've provided the demonstration units like the one you have. Um, you know, they'll be available in the clinics. Um, doctors have been requesting those demonstration units. So there should be no mystery about what's inside the pouch. But um, we do ask that it be stored in that until the time of use. Okay. Um, and it's, you know, so it's multifold purposes for having that pouch. Oh, it all makes sense. It just, and had I probably thought about it longer, you know what it really is, is that it was just different. And so than what I was accustomed to. So when I saw it, different felt wrong. And now you explain it to me and I go, oh, well, different seems like more well thought out and new and better. So uh, that's excellent. Can I give you, give you one anecdote as we were testing that pouch and sort of the size of it and how big the print was and everything else. We had a number of diabetes educators as part of our forum for focus groups. And there were some that wanted it even bigger because they wanted to write all kinds of instructions on the margins and the doctor's phone number and, you know, <laughs> reminders about other things. And so <laughs> it's like at some point we had to say, no, you know, we can't hand out this giant pouch. It's got to be small enough and portable enough. So, so, you know, there, there were a few rounds of things that, um, you know, led us to the current configuration. Did but, they, uh, did they have it up to the size where you could put three holes in it and people could uh, carried around in their yeah. binders. <laughs> there you go. So, so no, it's all intentional, and it contributes to the the long shelf life. It contributes to the successfully administering it in a time of emergency, um, and it also protects the product. Going back to the beginning of this thought for me, what I was getting ready to say when I asked you how long does the product last, you know, before it needs to be replaced, what I was going to say is I think I'm going to I'm going to move to the hypo pen afterwards um, because I can see how. Um, you know, it just, it, it would just make, I think this would be easy to show my daughter and say, look, if you really feel like you're in trouble, do this. And it wouldn't feel like, you know, a rigmarole, I guess, and, and, and maybe off-putting in any way. And so I thought I'll switch, but now I realize I've got to wait two years before I switch. So, uh, <laughs> I, um, I think you, you brought, you brought up another issue though, Scott, yeah. and that is pe- people stage them in different parts of their daily life, yeah. right? So they keep the pre-filled syringe in the nightstand at home. You might have the auto injector. 
at school or with the coaches or wherever. So, I mean, you know, mix and match, um, again, there's no difference that in the glucagon that's contained in either device it's right. the, it's the product. No, no, I, I, and I, I, I guess I was half kidding, but I, I do know that, you know, there are different, well, I guess if our kids ever go back to school, she'll need one for school and, and in a couple of other places. And it just, you know, I can't, I can't say it enough. It's, it's easy to have you on the show and talk about it because like I said, this is a leap and, and this is going to make people's lives, I think, easier if they should ever have an emergency and need to use it. And I think the comfort they're going to get from it, just having it around is, is going to be different. I, you know, I, I really don't mean to pile on somebody, but that, that red box is not comforting. It's off putting. And this, this thing I'm holding this pen here is, is comforting. So there's a lot to that. There's a lot to the psychological, uh, the psychological side of all this. And I appreciate that that was considered. Yeah. I think we've, you know, we've talked with folks, um, sort of who lived through all of this and seen the changes in technology and new delivery, um, you know, insulin certainly advanced and, and bringing forward CGM and um, pumps, and, you know, all these things have been uh, stepwise improvements. Uh, Bukagon just wasn't tackled. And, and, and now that we have, you know, we want to uh, keep making improvements and um, exploring other, other uses for it and um, beyond the, the, the currently approved one. And so the company's, you know, vested in making the most of a liquid ready to use Bukagon. Um, and so, you know, stay tuned for more on that. As I was jumping on this call, I got a message from somebody. It was so funny. They don't know the timing of my schedule, but they just were like, if you if you haven't spoken to the people at Givoke yet, can you please ask, is there water in insulin? And if there's water in insulin, can can insulin be made more stable with their technology? And I was like, I don't know. I'll find out. So I, maybe my bigger question is, are there other things you're stabilizing over there or are you just a glucagon company or is there more? Yeah, we are more than a glucagon company. So, you know, at our core, we want to take the technology to make liquid ready to use easily injectable, very stable products um, in all the areas where it makes sense. Um, we have talked about insulin um, and it's, it is a project. Um, it's not anything that's, uh, you know, advanced in terms of its clinical development, but we do recognize that um, there are limitations on the storage conditions for insulin, other things that it can be mixed with um, cause problems. So maybe we can start to combine it with other effective blood glucose lowering agents and make better combinations. So um, the, the short answer is yes, we can apply our technology to a broad range of drugs, uh, proteins, monoclonal antibodies, vaccines. And so, um, you know, that's our mission is to, uh, take all of the concern and difficulties of administering and storing a drug out of the equation. And so that's, that's kind of the, the future state of Xeris and, and how we'll apply ourselves. But you'll know us now as, as the glucagon company, first and foremost, and uh, you know, we will use that as a starting point and, and grow from there. But your technology applies to a lot of other things. So there are, there are probably many things that we can't talk about that are being considered there. And I'm, asking that question as a wink and a nod to all the people who ask me questions that uh, are not covered by your FDA approval. So I can't ask you here, but uh, they'll all understand when they hear this and be excited that you're working on other things. I think, is that fair? Oh, that's definitely fair. Good. And our, our company website, uh, separate from uh, gvoglucagon.com describes some of our pipeline and the things that are still in an experimental phase. Um, and you'll see that it's uh, glucagon, it's a drug called diazepam for seizures uh, and other programs. So we're, you know, we're, we're really interested in applying this technology broadly and solving problems for patients and their providers. Do you think it's possible that I'll ever be able to get Givoke in a vial for home use to just keep and administer as I need? We would like to pursue that. Yes. I think, um, you know, there are a number of applications of glucagon that are different than our approved use. Today, it's a one milligram. You deliver the whole dose uh, in the setting of restoring very low blood sugar. Uh, but there are other settings where maybe the smaller dose would be useful. Um, and, and so there are other settings, whether it's exercise, uh, whether it's hypoglycemia on awareness, um, other things where there are a series of you know, clinical development projects that we've sponsored. Um, uh, we've collaborated with one site as well um, as part of a uh, dual hormone delivery with insulin and glucagon as part of a 
uh, closed loop system. So you know, none, none of these are approved. Um, none of them are possible with the current configuration. We would need a vial of glucagon, as you described, Scott. So it'd be very similar to how you would administer insulin. You would have personalized doses uh, for the situation that you're trying to uh, manage. Um, so that's going to take us some time, but we are investing in those efforts. And I would just ask everybody to stay tuned for more. I, well, I'll say this from my heart, um, and many people may or may not understand this, and I guess if you've been around diabetes long enough, it, it makes sense, but it may not seem super exciting that someone figured out a way to make glucagon liquid stable, but it is super exciting, and that it opens so many doorways and possibilities for the future. Everyone who has someone that they love with type 1 diabetes or has type 1 diabetes should be incredibly jacked up and excited that you guys figured this out. And I know that it it's hard to wrap your head around why this is that exciting, but it is. And uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to what happens next. So I really appreciate you coming on and explaining all of this. Um, and I, I thank you for your time. Unless you want to play some piano, I think we're good. My pleasure, Scott. It was, I enjoyed it and uh, hope we can do it again sometime. Please. And my best to Bailey. She left the room. So oh, I'm damn it. <laughs> a, a, a cameo bark. So you'll have to cut that in. I thought, so. I thought I could get a little bark at the end and we'd be finished. Anyway, uh, thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Really, I appreciate your time. All right. Yeah, Take care. Appreciate it. Bye. Huge thanks to Gvoke for sponsoring this episode and for giving me the opportunity to speak with Ken. And a huge thank you to Jenny Smith for being such a good friend and coming on the show to talk about Gvoke. If you'd like to find out more about Gvoke, there are links right here in the show notes of your podcast player at juiceboxpodcast.com, or you could just type the words gvokeglucagon.com into any browser. To learn more about the company that makes Gvoke, go to xerispharma.com, X-E-R-I-S-P-H-A-R-M-A.com. I have a little bonus stuff here at the end for you, if you'd like to keep listening. I actually spoke to Ken the day before we recorded this, just for a few minutes so we could get to know each other, and he told me about his piano playing. So I brought it up at the beginning of this recording while we were getting the audio set up. So it was recorded, but you know, not really part of the episode. But I left it here because it's, it's interesting. What kind of music do you play? So I'm what they referred to, I guess, as a professional journeyman sideman. I'll play whatever, whatever comes my way. I read music. Okay. You know, I play from classical to jazz to tribute acts, including Pink Floyd and Van Morrison and uh, Aretha Franklin to classic wedding bands, you know, the most cliche kind of lounge music you could imagine. It doesn't really matter. Musical theater. Multiple, but, uh, multiple instruments or one? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a piano player, keyboard uh, player. That's really, that's an amazing skill to have. That is very cool. And it's, it's great that you get to do it too. Yeah. So Chicago, you know, traditionally has been a, a famous for lots and lots of live music. And of course, many famous bands have come out of here, but uh, we're in complete shutdown now. It's just awful. There's, There's no, nowhere. Yeah, and online really doesn't replicate it. There's been, I think one or two people who have done it well, it, you know, and it's, you know, you have to, you can see how much money you have to have. And ex a crazy example is that, I don't know if you saw, you may not like this kind of music, but maybe you do. You mentioned Pink Floyd. Metallica did an old song acoustically remotely. So all four guys were in a different place, but it sounds like it was recorded in a studio. So you have to assume that each one of them has a professional recording studio in their home, you know, um, but it, that worked out. But and that's exactly how they do it. And what we aren't led to understand as consumers is they record all those tracks independent of each other. And then somebody mixes them because right. you can't, you can't use zoom to have simultaneous music because whoever's talking the loudest takes over the channel. And so yeah. there's, no, there's no mixing on zoom. It's a, it's a big problem. You, so. Yeah. You have to have all that equipment and the willingness to spend a couple of million dollars to mix a song together, to release it. And they had that money and they did it. And, Everyone yeah. else is just, like you said, fumbling through trying to do it over Zoom. For those of you who are not familiar with the podcast and don't know who Jenny Smith is, I thought I'd take a second to let you know. Jenny's a frequent guest of the show. She's helped me put together series within the podcast like Defining Diabetes, Ask Scott and Jenny, and of course, the very popular Diabetes Pro Tip episodes. 
And of all the people I could have had on those episodes with me, here's why I picked Jenny. Jennifer Smith has had type 1 diabetes for over 30 years, since she was a child. She holds a bachelor's degree in human nutrition and biology from the University of Wisconsin. She is a registered and licensed dietitian, a certified diabetes educator, and a certified trainer on most makes and models of insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitoring systems. I love Jenny. She is a friend. And when I decided to do this episode, I asked her if she could help out a little bit. and She was very gracious and said yes. Jenny works at Integrated Diabetes, so you can check her out if you'd like at integrateddiabetes.com. 